I think war is coming. The experts I know in DC whom I, I trust, they're all over the map. The problem is, is there's an old adage that says the only thing you can't do with bayonets is sit on them. I, I think that while there's, you know, a huge percentage of what Putin's doing is the continuation of Shadow War, I think this is going to be the first time that he comes out fighting with, with conventional forces. While there will be uh, a, you know, limited use of tanks and, and things like that, I think what, what his end state is is to precipitate a leadership crisis in Ukraine. That he, his, his main target is Kiev, um, where you, know, you come in through the north um, with, with, you know, so you can circumvent the, a river, you know, any river crossings. Um, and then you just kind of put pressure elsewhere, maybe to a limited extent, seize that land bridge that you're talking about. And I think that's it. And I think once he gets a leadership change at the top of, of Ukraine's leadership, then he pulls tanks out. He's definitely, yeah. in my opinion, he's going to be using tanks. You don't position that many systems and things like that on the border and not use tanks. And there's, a, there's been a lot of inside expertise that 100,000 troops don't, don't cut it. But that's not important. What the, the chain? The idea is, if you can blitzkrieg to the to the outside the the walls of Kiev, show the world what you're capable of. Have a forcible, you know, you can perp walk out, you know, the the current leaders and put your own people in. You know, it's sort of like Hungary 1956 or Czechoslovakia 1968, and that's that's a big win for Putin. Right? I don't think he's going to annex Ukraine as like no. a part of the new federated Russia. But it'll be like Georgia in 2008 or something yep. like that. Man, we were accurate, weren't we? We nailed it. It's too bad there's not a futures market for war. Well, there is. It's called the stock market. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in the wrong. Obviously, I'm in the wrong business, the wrong profession. I, 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 I put in an order for Raytheon. Well, yeah, I did. I put in an order for Raytheon stock in December, but it was... It was at uh, eighty three dollars a share, and I wanted to get it at eighty one dollars a share. So let's mm -hmm. actually now I'm curious because I can I can see pretty quickly where, where it is right now. Now this is now now I sound like a war profiteer, but right now it's ninety nine dollars and eighty three eighty three cents a share. Oh, now I didn't I, I, mean, I didn't buy it because I was cheap. I was just like I'm yeah. not going to pay any more than eighty one dollars a share. But uh -huh. that's yeah, a twenty percent twenty percent gain in in two months. Remind me when you start your next hedge fund. I want to be a part of it because I oh, they don't, I have they don't no let, acumen for this stuff. They don't let barbarians like me anywhere near hedge funds. Um, <laughs> That's too I, bad. I, I'm not political <laughs> enough. I'm not political enough. I'm right, but I'm not political enough. Um, so much so, capitalism, uh, yeah. yeah. For everyone who, who has been living under a rock, this is uh, Dr. Sean McFate. Uh, he's recently had, I, I've seen like a video on The Independent and an article that you had in The Independent. Uh, I think today or yesterday. And then I also read your Hill, Hill article. I probably missed half a dozen other things, but uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're on fire right now. So welcome yeah, back. A and, lot of stuff. And, and I don't know why you spend any time with me, but. Uh, well, you're, because <laughs> we're, we're battle buds from Harvard. So, you know, we were in the trenches together doing economics. And of course you were helping with my homework. So, so, it, you know, it's a full circle in many ways, but it's, it's um, always good to be back, Sean. Yeah, always a pleasure. So, so today, um, you know, we're not going to belabor what we discussed the last time because you saw you saw the the uh, the clips that we had at the beginning. Um, yeah. What we're going to focus on, though, is what's what's Putin's next move. You know, yeah. given given everything, and then Sean, do you want to give like a brief level set of where 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 what's going on right now in the russia ukraine war kind of where oh, generally sure. where forces are etc okay so uh, first of all the war isn't even a week old okay so the war started like thursday now it's like a week so what are we today thursday or wednesday i forget i yeah i think this is I day six thursday or night. seven it's yeah. probably we're seven or eight six. actually right so this is the 3rd of March, and it feels like a month have passed between the beginning and end of this. And we, we recorded this like a ways before this. And so Putin invaded, 
And uh, I will just say that most of the experts in the national, the U.S. national security, you know, community totally missed it. All the, all the, I'm talking, I'm not talking about the intelligence community, but most of like the, the quote unquote experts totally, totally missed it. So it kind of reminds me a little bit like um, the financial crisis of 2008 when all the, uh, the, you know, the very high paid. Uh, financial analysts around the world uh, totally didn't see that coming. It was a, you know, however, the the U.S. intelligence community called it very accurately, and um, kudos to them because they are, you know, they have a bad reputation now because of multiple things: uh, not seeing the end of Afghanistan, not seeing the beginning of 9/11, not seeing WMD in Iraq or lack thereof. I mean, the end of the Cold War. I mean, all these things, and they. They, the, the, the intelligence committee really pulled it out. Um, there are some other experts who did call it, like a colleague of mine, Michael Hoffman, who's at Center for Naval Analysis, uh, who, is a, who is deep inside of the Russian you know, strategic culture. Uh, he called it, but nobody believed him. It was sort of a Cassandra's curse, like Noah in the Ark. We mm-hmm. called it. Um, but of course, it's just you and I, Sean. So, uh, yeah, you know, nobody listens to, um, nobody, well, they listen to you. They don't listen to me. <laughs> yes. We called, but we called it. Um, right. And now, and now, Russia has gone full on conventional war, or so it seems, a blitzkrieg, a conventional war into Ukraine. The last time the world saw a conventional war like this was the 1980s. It was the Iran Iraq War or the Falkland Islands or maybe Gulf Gulf Storm One in 1991. And the, the last time Europe saw a war like this was when Hitler did this. Um, and so the world is shocked. And now, you know, people are talking, you know, and then Putin has threatened nuclear war. So people are talking about, you know, is this a new cold war? And um, so I, I guess this sets us up really well. It's like, what is Putin and Russia going to do? Because this war that they assumed that he assumed would be a cakewalk, rolling the tanks into into Ukraine and they would just melt away, like Ukraine would just melt away um, under the might of the, you know, Russian hegemon with you know claiming centuries of cultural simulation and of course that did not happen in fact it backfired so i think what we should do is sort of start with that we're in day think, six of this war putin has got think, some surprises I, I think that's a great way to start now i don't know where i said this um i don't know if i said it on on air if i just typed it somewhere in facebook but from the very beginning i said i said it would take three to six weeks and the reason I got to that number is the Iraq war. That was the fastest so operation Cobra two, the fastest invasion in history. And it still mm-hmm. took six weeks and it took six weeks with the population at the time, welp- welcoming U S forces with open arms. Okay. Right. Well, I'll tell you right now, if there's anything that's completely self-evident in this case, the Russians ain't getting yeah. welcomed with, with open arms. They're getting welcomed with uh, Molotov cocktails and, and uh, you know, an angry, a very angry population. So I, although I do believe based on, you know, kind of what I've seen behavior that Putin actually believed it would take a few days. And, and I believe that, um, as I said in the earlier um, show, is his intention was always to do that, those two main thrusts, you know, on either side of the Dnieper River to sit and circle Kiev. And then he was using the rest of his forces to pin and distract and fix the Ukrainian army on the eastern and southern border. Now, I think, I think given the initial signs of resistance that he's seen, uh, massive and embarrassing logistical problems, which the United States military, frankly, takes for granted that we're, you know, the, the United States has always been a logistical machine. The, the Russian, you know, attack is, is slowing, you know, is grinding to a halt. However, the other things, the other thing that has surprised me about the Russians was, and this is, I don't mean to sound insensitive when I say this, because any amount of casualties and, and violence are a terrible thing on civilian populations, But I've never seen the Russian military this restrained in terms of 
you know, the Russian way of war is one of, you take the Battle of Grozny, for instance, where they absolutely leveled cities, firing ballistic missiles into, into cities, firing, uh, you know, Grad, multiple uh, rocket launcher system, launch systems. They, they fight indiscriminately and they absolutely annihilate their foes. In this case, that, that while there have been some mistakes and some terrible things that have happened, I think you're starting to see that aspect of the war start to ratchet up. I think when Putin realizes that he's going to get resistance, he's going to want to end this thing. The other problem that I see is we've kind of offered the man no way out. So I'll give you an example. So you take some of these sanctions and I try to put myself into like the, the everyday Russian situation. Let's say George w, w. w. Bush had invaded Iraq and then all of a sudden Russia freezes my bank account. Am I going to have sympathy for Russia? Am I, you know, am I going to support like that's just so I think the longer these sanctions go on, the more you're gonna radicalize the Russian population. And I think it's gonna have the opposite effect on the population than one would expect. So that's kind of where I see we are today. My concern is the man has a no way, no way out in terms of he has to commit. He's already committed and he can't move on. Is there, is there a way out for him right now, given the sanctions and, and everything that kind of the, the way is? Well, I think you raised two really good points. I mean, we should take them separately. Like one is what is Russia or Putin's next move? And the second is what are the impacts of sanctions? Because they don't bite immediately. They take some time to bite. So there's a near-term question about his next move. And there's, there's the, like the midterm question about what happens when the sanctions really start to, to bite uh, you know, Russia. So in terms of the first question, I think, you know, Putin, it seems to me that Putin assumed that, you know, Ukrainians are just misled brothers. And if they just roll the tanks in in a very friendly way, they'll just join the cause and capitulate in the sign of like, oh, big brother's here, I'll just do what he says. He was not prepared for what occurred, which is Zelensky, the comedian, in his mind, and the, the, the fierce resistance of the Ukrainian people. And, you know, of course, you know, Putin, you know, he, he says that the worst event in the 20th century was, was the, the death of the USSR, which if you think about all the horrible things that in the 20th century is ridiculous, right? Right. Um, there's also word uh, from Putin watchers that over the last couple of years, he's insulated himself with yes men, with, with people who are senior KGB colleagues, and he hasn't really talked to a lot of other people. So that is, you know, that potentially is biasing his thinking. Um, the, and the third is that he's still stuck in 2014 and he's with the first Ukrainian and Ukraine's learned a lot of lessons since 2014. Mm -hmm. They've gotten a lot of help, a lot of, you know, and that we don't, we don't, we forget this, but Ukraine, besides the 30 years of independence they've had from Russia, has always had a troubled history with Russia as an imperial force. Um, there was a... a a, a Ukrainian insurgency right after World War II that the CIA was back was backed for many years um, against the Soviet Russia. And the, the, the CIA gave up because it was just too much. But throughout the history of Russia, there's it's never been like Ukraine. You, saying Ukraine's a part of Russia is like saying Tibet's a part of China. It's just historically you know, ahistorical. <laughs> so um, no, China, but China would strongly... The, China would strongly disagree with you on that. Point. Yeah, of course they would. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Russia. So this is the mythology of Tsar Putin the Great, right? As he extend, he doesn't really want a USSR. He wants a Russian empire back. And, and, and there's ways that we can manipulate that against him. But that's a different convo. Um, so, yeah, he is totally surprised. But let's remember, he, he's gone in so far with a velvet glove. Mm -hmm. He's kept like, you know, a third of his force in reserve. Of course, some of them don't have diesel fuel, but let's leave that aside. 
you know, or ammunition or food, or ammunition. but just keep going. Yeah. And a lot of them are conscripts who, who, who were told like, this will be a cakewalk. Don't worry. They'll greet you like liberators. I mean, we've heard this before, right? It, it, it sounds like some weren't even, weren't even, they were told it was an exercise. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Imagine just, crossing the borders you know, and you're just shooting. Oh, oh wait, I, I have, well, they would have had to know they had live rounds, but like, wait, they're shooting back? What's yeah. going on? That's right. Yeah. Or people like, you know, putting themselves in our tank treads. Um, and, uh, you know, and so they, they've, exp they've experienced, and also there's been no serious cyber attacks, all these sneaky tricks that, the Russian way of warfare really likes to do. And here's what I think the next move is. Um, Putin will have, a, um, as they would say, a sort of a, a shit or get off the pot moment, right, mm -hmm. for his own legacy, because this is a legacy item for him. Uh, you know, cobbling back the, the, the Russian empire, not the Soviet one. He's not a communist. The Russian empire, that's his legacy item. And he's been, you know, in control for 22 years. This is, we're approaching, you know, end game, end game times for him. So he is not going to back out now because there's resistance. He, he will double down. So what we'll see, as you mentioned, is Grozny 2, cyber attacks, all the nasties. Um, and so just so listeners know, like, when NATO and the U.S. do counterinsurgency operations in Iraq or Afghanistan, we had a like we have to win hearts and minds. That's not the Russian approach to counterinsurgency. What they do is they they pancake cities, and they don't care about civilian casualties. It's worth it to them. They don't really care. That's what they did in the, against the Chechen insurgency of 1999. When Putin became like prime minister or whatever back then, he ordered the military to go to the, the capital of Chechnya, which is Grozny, which they have been fighting in for many years. And he said, just flatten the place. And they used missiles and artilleries to do that. The Russians killed at least five to 8,000 civilians in the process in a few weeks, but it ended the insurgency. And I fear that that's what he's going to do next. He's going to do cyber attacks. He's going to do, he already has Wagner Group and, you know, and Spetsnaz in Kiev trying to find uh, President Zelensky to assassinate him. They're acting as a fifth column. They're just, they're, they'll probably set up a wall of tanks against, you know, Hungary, Poland, Romania, sort of, the, you know, making a sort of a, an iron wall again against NATO countries. And we'll use weaponized starvation to subdue the, the resistance. Uh, they may even do sort of Gestapo moves, like for every Russian soldier you kill, we'll just pull 10 random Ukrainians and kill them. You, know? you think the Russians would uh, go that far? I think they Even could, today? yeah. Yeah, they wouldn't do it with their own troops. They'd use mercenaries like the Wagner and Group. And Chechens. And they actually Chechens, Chechens. Yeah, mm -hmm. they would, today they it was announced, at least in uh, media, that they're going to, you know, that one of the Chechen hit squads has been captured and killed by the Ukrainians. Yeah, they're the to verify. Kinder, Kinderovites, right? Yeah, exactly. So they wouldn't bloody their own hands. They're going to keep a insulation layer of plausible deniability. It doesn't fool many people, but it gives them enough leeway to beat the 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 nano second news cycle. So that is what they could do. And of course, you know, Putin always threatens nukes, but I'm not so I'm not so convinced he'd actually go that far. So uh, but but the question, you know, that's a different question too. Like would he? Right. And I think there is a there is a there's a scenario where he would and there's a scenario where his subordinates would let him and his subordinates would not. So I yeah. don't really know how that's going to well, happen. Like, like all dictators, right? It's all about when you're, when you're constructing a policy response, it's all about self-preservation, right? So if right. you don't threaten their grip on power, you can, you can work against it. However, if your, your aim is to extract them or regime change, you're going to have you're going to risk nuclear war. And I, and I think our policymakers are bright enough. And, and even with Biden's very clear language that we are not going to send troops into Ukraine, repeat over and over again, that is, that is a clear communication less to the American people and more to the other <clears throat> side to make it very yeah. clear that we do not, we do not want to escalate. Well, here's the problem though with that is that Ukraine 
Well, looking, looking, let's backtrack a bit. So one of the things I wrote about in 2019 in my book, The New Rules of War, is that countries should start investing in foreign legions. Now, when you think of foreign legions, you think of mercenaries, the French, and Jean-Claude Van Damme. I know, that's what your, the reader's thought bubble is. Um, but in truth, you know, foreign le- like the, the French foreign legion, and I've worked with them closely, they're, they're a French army unit. They answer to French officers. They only work for Paris. They have French doctrine, but their enlisted personnel come from around the world, and you know they they work for uh, they volunteer uh, for uh, for citizenship. Now, there's multiple reasons why that would be advantageous to Western countries. I'm not going to get into it right now, but the Ukrainians and I've who read the book and I I know them are trying to create a foreign legion right now in mm-hmm. Ukraine to fight the Russians. Um, it's, it's the International it's the Legion, right? Yeah, it's the, yeah. And, and, and think of it like this, it's sort of like in the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s, you'd had international yes. brigades of the communists versus the fascists or whatever. This feels it, actually, very, like that. this feels very much like that. Like, like that, we're not there yeah. yet, but it feels like we're moving toward that. That's a great reference. I've it been is. thinking about that, but I haven't articulated yeah. it out loud yet. Yeah. Well, as, as as Churchill said at the time, of course, he was in the wilderness then, but is that they are war, war tourists, you know, like all these international yeah. people. Like Hemi- and, um, I mean, Hemingway, that's like Hemingway went. Right, and, you know, exactly. Yeah. And so Zelensky says he's got like 16,000 of these people who signed up. We don't think it's that high, but the, the point is, is they're trying to do it. So here's the, that's interesting in a lot of, you know, that, that brings a lot of interesting aspects to this fight. But it also brings the risk of could this suck the U.S. and NATO into a war in Ukraine? Because, because some Yahoo went over there, gets captured, tortured. They become yeah. a, a bargaining chip. That's Sorry, right. I mean, to steal Putin, your thunder, thunderbird. No, it's true. But and Putin's a master disinformation as an ex KGB mm-hmm. agent. So you, so you know he'll you know he'll make the Gary Powers trial look like amateur hour. It's gonna be like Gary Powers meets Kim Kardashian. And and for those who don't know Gary Paris, he was a, an American YouTube pilot who was shot down in like 1960 over the Soviet Union. And he didn't um, kill himself like he's supposed to. And they, the Soviets captured and put him on a huge show trial to really embarrass the United States, which it did. Um, so you could imagine like what will happen when, you know, a Russian army, you know, gets in a firefight with a bunch of frankly, American ex-army vets who are looking for something to do, um, waving the American flag, you know, and, and they get captured, tortured on YouTube. And, um, you know, could this escalate into something really ugly? Does the U.S. have to send in a mission to rescue them? Could it be like, you know, does, you know, could it be like the, the 1980 uh, rescue of, of Iranian hostages, you know, could it be a disaster? So these, well, here's, here's, these types, here's, yeah. Here's a question that immediately occurs to me right now. Uh, what is even the policy uh, for the, of the U.S. government for a situation like that? What if somebody volunteers and goes over there? Is that, are they going to be blocked? Are they going to be, uh, because there should be something that's stated, like if you go over there, we're not, you know, you're, you're on your own. We're not going to come... I, well, I, I, I think Biden's made that very clear in his, in his multiple press conferences that the U.S. will not save any American citizens who are there. Like, you're on your own. Now, uh, you know, that can change. Yeah, there's a journal. <laughs> if the journalist gets captured, right? It right. Becomes I mean, there's a issue. lot of ways. There's a lot of things that can change for that. Um, and uh, so we don't know. We're, you know, is it illegal? I don't know. I mean, they're, they're not they're not really mercenaries because they're not going over, over there because they're not, they're not getting paid. They're doing it as volunteers. So this happened like in 2014 uh, during the as ISIS sort of took over Iran and Syria, uh, Iraq and Syria. Um, a lot of ex-military vets went to like, quote unquote, Kurdistan to Erbil to fight with the Peshmerga the Kurdistan military to wipe out ISIS, right? Um, they weren't arrested. They weren't mercenaries. They weren't doing it for beta. And you also have a lot of Ukrainian Americans who are also volunteering for this. So they may have dual citizenship or something. But you want, you know, what What about like, I also know like, uh, you know, there, there are American special forces guys there or ex, you know, ex-special forces guys because they want to do 
you know, they want to be the right side of history. And, um, and they're probably not satisfied with being Walmart readers either. So this is something for them. But I don't know what the U.S. policy will be on this, ultimately. Yeah, they better act fast because the policy is going to set itself if they don't. Yeah. I mean, seriously, like we're raising questions here that I, I haven't heard anybody in the media raise. I have, like it just feels like they're they're just way behind the power curve. Um, the yeah. other, here's the, here's another scenario. Um, what about Blackwater? Can can the Ukrainians hire Blackwater? Are we going to be okay with that? Well, they're not going to hire Blackwater, Blackwater, because they're sort of defunct. But they they could hire like a Western private military company for sure. Um, and maybe they're trying to do that right now because we, we know that Russia has its private military company, Wagner Group, on, on the ground in Kiev right now, trying to assassinate Ukrainian President Zelensky, enacting as a fifth column of saboteurs to prep the battlefield for the, the Russian invasion of, of Kiev. Um, and, and the thing about the Wagner Group, for those who don't know, these are Russian mercenaries, they're Russian-speaking mercenaries, but they don't work for the Russian army. They work for an oligarch. His name is Prigozhin. And Prigozhin is in, in the inner circle of, of Putin. He also, in addition to, or, to owning the Wagner Group, he also owns the Troll Factory, the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, which has tried to hack our elections and do a lot of disinformation. And he uses them in combination. So the Troll Factory uses disinformation to create the fog of war. And the Wagner Group goes slithers through it for victory. And the Wagner Group, they're not like cartoonish Hollywood bad guys. They are lethal mofos. These are ex Spetsnaz, which are Russian special forces. Um, they are, uh, they've been around for since 2013, 14. And in, to give you some sense of them, in 2018, they secretly went up against, um, you know, American Delta Force and Green Berets in Eastern Syria. Okay. And 400 Wagner mercenaries against, I don't know, it was like maybe 30 or 50 of our best troops with their, with their Kurdish allies in a defensive position in a Conoco gas plant. And the battle was a stalemate for two hours, a stalemate, until American troops called in air support. And our AC-130 gunships, Apache helicopters, drones, basically annihilated systematically <laughs> the Wagner group, the, the ones that were there that night. They killed about two to 300. And we probably killed more Russians that one night than any night in the Cold War, right? But the reason both sides could walk it back and not have it go to World War III is they could say, yeah, they were just mercenaries. What do we care? And you know that's why Russia likes to use the Wagner group. And it also shows you how powerful the Wagner group is. I mean, if they could, they could go up against our very best and, and stand and deliver for two hours, what happens when they go up against uh, Ukrainian militia, right? It'll be, it'll be bloody. So that's what, that's what, you know, we look at this as conventional war because you see, you know, columns of tanks and armored vehicles, but there's a very unconventional underbelly to this war and when things start to ratchet up which they will um you're going to see much more of that and it'll be a lot bloodier and a lot less um discriminate in terms of fire firepower so there's this 40 kilometer is it 40 kilometer or 40 mile 40 mile column of tanks <clears throat> and armored vehicles that's bearing down on kiev or kiev i should start calling it kiev um but it's just sitting there where it's been immobile for a, a little bit of time. The Ukrainians have attacked it. I think have destroyed some of the vehicles, but what's going on? Are they just out of fuel? Or are they waiting for forces to develop the situation inside? The I city? think they're waiting. I mean, I think there is a lot of logistical supply problems for two reasons. One is that the Russians are not very good at it. You know, I mean, as you said earlier, the, the U.S., we're spoiled. We, we are very good at, you know, just in time delivery of whatever you need. Uh, they are not. Um, and the second is because they have an OPSEC problem. I think, you know, Putin's inner circle kept this thing so secret for so long that when he said go, people didn't really know on the ground what exactly to do. 
uh, because it could have gone so many different ways. So they kind of like, I think Putin outsmarted his own troops in many ways by being so wily. And um, so I don't know, but I think like they're in reserve for something. And what that something is, I do not know. Yeah, I mean, I think Obviously it's an attack in Kiev, but yes. Yeah, well, I think it's the encirclement of Kiev and then they'll send in what they need, yeah. but I think they're going to strangle it until right. they find, you know, deny access in and out until they find right. the leadership, find the leadership, <clears throat> send them to, you know, the, their list of camps and, and, and things like right. that. Right. And then, I think, um, yeah, I think they're trying yeah, to let their, their, their dark, their black forces, if you were dark, dark soft, what do you want to call it? Do its magic for a little bit longer. And then if uh, Putin gets frustrated, he'll send the order and in they go to, to have a siege of it. When do you think he flips the Grozny switch? Um, it's a great question. I don't know. I think that, um, look, the, the worst case for Putin is this. A, he, he made some strategic assumptions that were wrong, that this would be a cakewalk, that he would absorb Ukraine the way he absorbed Georgia. And, you know, um, and that's not been the case. Um, the longer this pro, you know, time is in the favor of the resistance. So the longer he lets this go on, the weaker he looks. And, as, and, and he, you know, worst case scenario for him is that the resistance protracts the conflict. Zelensky doesn't you know, disappear and he's treated as a hero. It solidifies NATO, which it's been doing. I mean, a yeah. year ago, NATO was brain dead. And what now, like, yeah, what Germany. Yeah, Germany. Right. I mean, even Germany. Um, and now NATO is like resurrected. I mean, it's amazing to watch. And um, if the EU grants Ukraine you know, citizenship in the EU. And like real effort now is like, we're going to make Ukraine part of NATO. That would um, literally trigger Putin. He's not going to go away. This is his legacy item. So I think he'll turn to Grozny at that point. When that point occurs, I don't know. I'm not saying that point is when you know, uh, Ukraine joins NATO. That may or may not happen, but Ukraine's already put the application for the European Union. Um, and as long as this, the, the, the more the, the, the international, I mean, and if the US can create a wedge strategy to divide Russia from China, to truly isolate Russia, that might force Putin's hand uh, to do some of the the you know the, the Grozny two tactics, right? Just like you know, just kill people, like get the media out and flatten the place, right? And worst case, use tactical nukes, not strategic ones, what we think of like World War Three, but use a few, you know, just even even if he explodes a tactical nuke in Siberia, it would put the world on notice, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that he's got a few aces up his sleeve. And I think he's okay with being a pariah state. And I think he's okay with letting the Russian people suffer. I think he wants regime security more than he wants Russian national security. Which, which this whole invasion kind of, in having the opposite effect of what he intended, I think it put his regime in. By the way, this is just a random thought. Do you have any insight on why he sits at this, the head of this 60 foot table and like everybody, is there any insight in that? I have no clue. There's a lot of discussion about is he, is he deranged now? Is that, I mean, Senator Rubio said this is not the same Putin we saw six years ago. I mean, it's really difficult to play armchair psychologist. I would say two things. I mean, one is probably a COVID scare. But two, I think, you know, I wouldn't put it past Putin to have a, you know, to be histrionic about power and using like these nonverbal sub you know subconscious symbols yeah, of who's got power and political you know, theater, mind right. games yeah and he's a kgb agent and he's he's been masterful as a politician doing these things so i just that's what i attribute it to he's doing his power psycho games okay so so here's here's what i think his strategy is over the next few weeks i think it's shifted i, I you know as i originally suggested it was this two-pronged attack to surround and encircle or encircle and surround 
Kiev or Kiev. Uh, and then the rest of his forces were mainly to pin the bulk of Ukrainian combat power in the east and in the south. I think that's changed. I think based on, uh, you know, with the, having fought like the Soviets, right, they would throw everything at the front. And once they established a point of penetration, they would jam everything through it. I think that's where the, the sh I think they're shifting back to that old saw of Soviet doctrine and tactics. And I think they've uh, had so, uh, one or two breakthroughs. I think they seized Kursan, right? Um, and then uh, it might be the only, I don't even know if they've seized Kursan. They, they, they're, they're in much better control than they were, but they're having some limited success in the South and a little bit less success, but some limited success in the East. So I think what, the shift in strategy now is the primary strategy is still to encircle Kiev, but if that is unsuccessful, then I think it shifts into a broader operation to take all of Ukraine to the east of the Dnieper. Then I think we have some weird kind of um, thing, like a feeling that harkens back to the old east-west Germany dynamic. It doesn't mean to say that that's going to happen, but I think the future of this particular situation in history is going to shift toward more of an end game like that simply because the other thing too, is he only brought 200, 190,000, 200,000 forces. And uh, what's the ratio to, to dominate a civilian population. Isn't 25 to one. It's, right? it's unclear, but I mean, this is what T Lawrence calls the algebraic factors. I mean, do you have enough people to control the territory? And you, you can take it, but can you hold it? And, you know, Ukraine's like Texas, uh, you know, 200,000 is not nearly enough. You probably need 500 to 1 million people. Um, but it, of course, he didn't expect this resistance. I think he things would have developed differently if he did, is my guess. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, that's that's where it's where it's heading. And I, and I agree with you that it's going to become more like a traditional Soviet type. And I know we're talking about Russians, but you know, it's the same, you know, doctrine and tactics. You're going to see more of that. You're going to see ballistic missiles. You're going to see the, the garads. You're going to see um, some, some nasty stuff. The other thing that I'm, and we'll, we'll talk about this in, in actually the next episode, but so far the Ukrainians, I think, have restrained themselves as well, right? They're not behaving like the Chechens did in the first uh, Chechen war. And yeah. we'll, We'll get into that in the next section, but I think we'll leave leave folks with with uh, all these items to noodle on. And in the next segment, we're going to talk about what what can be done. Thank you. That everyone. was great. Thank you, Sean.